Chapter 3, The Realist. I'm Jennifer Dowd. I'm an associate professor of demography and population health at the Leverhulme Center for Demographic Science, uh, University of Oxford. Our third expert witness takes a rather different view than either the authorities in Sweden or our expert in part one when it comes to controlling virus transmission in the immediate term. In short, she believes that we can and should hold out longer for a vaccine. But I recognize that we'll probably face some disappointments where the first couple of vaccines may not work or not work as well as, as we hoped. So I think we do need to be willing to reevaluate as time goes by. But the human toll of assuming that we won't get any vaccine or treatment and just letting everyone get infected is so high that I, I definitely believe it's worth buying some time. Jennifer thinks that the dominant priority should be reducing the risk of fatalities caused by the virus. We can see from what happened in March and April with the excess mortality being extremely high that if we don't do anything to mitigate transmission, the human cost would be extremely high. So from my reading of the mortality data and the evidence we're gaining about potential long-term health effects of the infection, I think the best strategy is to suppress transmission as low as we can, especially with some of these hopeful vaccines and treatments on the horizon. We heard in part one the case for allowing the virus to transmit more freely amongst younger age groups. Jennifer says the problem is that demographics may make this approach to managing the pandemic unworkable. One problem is just the sheer size of the older group in aging populations, which is most of Europe and North America. You know, there's often 20% of the population that's over 65 for starters. And then if you add people with underlying health conditions who might be cancer survivors, many different comorbidities, you get up to a sizable proportion of the population that might need to be shielded. And then we know that we don't actually live in these age segregated bubbles and there's lots of opportunities for spillover from younger to older adults. There's multi-generational households, which also varies across countries. So Sweden actually doesn't have that many multi-generational households and, and that seemed to protect them a little bit in that initial wave. And Italy was hit especially hard because there was an easy way for that transmission from younger to older people to happen very quickly. So there hasn't been a plan put forward that gives the logistics of how we would cordon off different parts of society and make that work in reality. It's also worth mentioning that in Sweden, half the population lives alone. Those of us who share accommodation may need to restrict our interaction outside the home. I think we are hunkering down for a long winter and we need to be honest with people that things are not gonna change overnight and we need to continue to adapt our lifestyles as far as working from home if possible, limiting our social interactions in risky environments, but also looking for ways to adapt and have those connections in a safer way because there definitely are ways to do that. So I hope it's not just about telling people what they can't do, but helping people adapt to the new normal. Because if we all make sacrifices for a few more months, I think you know, that seems worth it and very feasible. Of course, the longer it goes on without a vaccine, I think those trade-offs will get more challenging. Perhaps amid the urgent storm of new measures to control the pandemic, we've failed to grasp proper perspective on its broader significance. You know, I think we had watershed moments like 9-11 for terrorism, and I think this might be sort of our loss of innocence about infectious disease where we see more permanent changes to our daily life, um, whether a vaccine comes or not. <laughs>